This podcast is the second in a series on the Mr. Cruel Crimes. It assumes you have listened to the previous episode. If you have not, I would recommend you go back and listen to episodes 1 and 2 before listening to this episode. For the best part of 30 years, the majority of media reports have linked the perpetrator known as Mr. Cruel with four attacks on children aged between 10 and 13. As mentioned in previous posts, these attacks, known as the canonical Mr. Cruel attacks, were the sexual assault of an 11 or 12 year old girl in Lower Plenty on the 22nd of August 1987, the abduction of Sharon Wills on the 27th of December 1988, the abduction of Nicola Linus on the 3rd of July 1990, and the abduction of Carmen Chan on the 13th of April 1991 and her subsequent murder. However, at different times since 1985, the police or the media have also linked this same perpetrator to another 12 sexual assaults at least. At present, it is unknown if any of these attacks have been definitively ruled out by investigators as being the work of Mr. Cruel. Some of these attacks are as follows. 1. The abduction and sexual assault of a 14-year-old girl in Hampton in February 1985. 2. The abduction and sexual assault of a 14-year-old boy in Hampton in July 1985. 3. The sexual assault of a 30-year-old woman in her Warrandyte home on the 4th of December 1985. 4. The sexual assault of a 30 or 35-year-old woman in her Donvale home on the 6th of December 1985. 5. The sexual assault of a 34-year-old woman in her Bullying home on the 7th of December 1985. 6. The sexual assault of a woman in Greensboro in March 1987. 7. The sexual assault of a woman in Greensboro on the 8th of August 1987. 8. The sexual assault of a 48-year-old woman in Mooney Ponds on the 10th to 11th of November 1987. 9. The sexual assault of an unknown victim in Hawthorne between 1985 and 1987. 10. The sexual assault of an unknown victim in Brighton between 1985 and 1987. 11. The sexual assault of an unknown victim in Caulfield between 1985 and 1987. And 12. The sexual assault of an unknown victim in Dingley between 1985 and 1987. The Hampton Rapist Let us analyse what has been said about these attacks in the media and who has linked them to Mr. Cruel over the years. The sexual assault of a 14-year-old girl in Hampton in February 1985 was first linked to the perpetrator known as Mr. Cruel by writers John Sylvester and Andrew Rule in their 2008 book Rats, Crooks Who Got Away With It, Tales of True Crime and Mystery from the Underbelly Archive. The co-writers wrote only briefly about this attack, stating, quote, Police had been looking for a man they called the Hampton Rapist, who, they suspected, abducted a 14-year-old from her home in February 1985. They believed the same man was responsible for attacks in Caulfield, Hawthorne, Brighton, Dingley and Donvale. He was an opportunist who would break into houses looking for money, but who would sexually assault victims if he had the chance. The Hampton rapist was believed to be the same man responsible for later attacks, including Carmen Chance. Much later, after thousands of hours of fruitless investigations, police were to conclude there were probably two offenders, possibly one a copycat. While some of the Hampton assaults had striking similarities to the later one, police finally established that the first known attack by Mr. Cruel was in Lower Plenty in August 1987. One confusing point about this information is that Sylvester and Rule's book suggests that police later ruled out the earlier attacks. Quote, After thousands of hours of fruitless investigations. Yet this contradicts Keith Moore's later information that some detectives did indeed consider at least two of the 1985 attacks in Hampton as being the work of Mr. Cruel. Furthermore, Sylvester and Rule's source is the only one on the public record that has ever attributed attacks in Hawthorne, Caulfield, Brighton and Dingley as being possibly the work of Mr. Cruel, and nothing more is known about any of them. The Donvale attack referred to must be the same one mentioned in the contemporary newspaper articles 
as that of the rape of the 30 or 35 year old woman in December of 1985. Scared and Scarred Schoolgirl The sexual assault of a 14 year old girl in Hampton in February 1985 was also linked to the perpetrator known as Mr. Cruel by journalist Keith Moore in his article for the Herald Sun, Mr. Cruel suspected of at least a dozen attacks on children, dated the 12th of April 2016. In the article, Moore stated, quote, One of the incidents police believe may have been one of the first Mr. Cruel attacks involved a 14-year-old girl who was abducted from her Hampton home in 1985. She was tied, gagged and blindfolded before being driven to a vacant building site and assaulted. The scared and scarred schoolgirl was dumped at the nearby Moorabbin Bowl on the Peen Highway at 2.10am, nearly five hours after being kidnapped. I cannot find any reference to this crime in any major Melbourne newspaper, nor any local newspaper from the time period. The 1985 survivor, in her statement, believes the assailant ejaculated in her and swabs were taken. Another reference I have found to this crime was in Adam Shan's documentary Australian True Crime Stories, Season 3, Episode 7, which appeared on the Nine Network in 2019. Quote, As I mentioned earlier, Mr. Cruel could be connected to up to 12 assaults. I've spoken at length to Mr. Cruel's first documented victim from 1985. Understandably, she doesn't want to talk on camera, but she did relay what he said to her during the assault. Quote, my liberty, my freedom is more important than your life. This is very telling when viewed through the lens of the Carmen Chan murder. In the mid-1980s, DNA testing was in its infancy and poor forensic work in the early cases dramatically impacted later investigations. The scene then cuts to an interview with Keith Moore who states, quote, Quite a lot of the original witness statements from 1985, 86, 87 that David Sprague desperately wanted were never able to be found. In one case, I think it was his first victim, had been tied up. The rope was retrieved, but the rope had been put into a plastic bag. Whilst he got very good at covering his tracks, common sense suggests you don't start off that good. If he was ever going to make mistakes, it would have been in those early days. That rope could have had his DNA on it, and the Spectrum Task Force were mortified when they couldn't find the rope. The documentary then cuts to a visual of a plastic bag marked with the title Police Evidence and a hand belonging to an unknown person picking it up and taking it out of the scene. It is not clear what the producers of this film were implying by showing this visualization, but it certainly seems to hint at some sort of conspiracy. The scene then cuts back to Adam Shand interviewing former detective Chris O'Connor and Shand states, quote, the 1985 survivor, in her statement, believes the assailant ejaculated in her and swabs were taken. Do you think if they are around, they could still be tested? Chris O'Connor replies, quote, They could certainly be matched if they're still in existence. What is unclear about this exchange is whether the swabs taken from the 1985 Hampton victim are still in existence or not. The placing of this scene, in which the question is put to O'Connor by Shand, just after the scene in which Keith Moore has described the police losing evidence, is odd indeed, but it is not clear what the intention was here, since it is never verified that the semen swabs taken from the 1985 Hampton victim were also lost. The viewer then is left to decide for themselves as to whether a. the semen swabs are still in existence, and b. There was some sort of conspiracy that led to police evidence being lost in this case. Furthermore, what that conspiracy might be in the latter case is never dealt with. Neither Keith Moore's article nor Shan's documentary state what month in 1985 the attack on the 14-year-old girl occurred, but we can deduce that it occurred in February 1985 because Moore's article states that the next attack attributed to Mr. Krull that of a 14-year-old boy, occurred, quote, on July 6, 1985, five months after the attack on the 14-year-old Hampton schoolgirl, end quote. And this matches up with the date given by Sylvester and Rule in their own discussion of the same attack. He was held captive and assaulted in unknown premises for just over three hours. 
Keith Moore, in his article for the Herald Sun dated the 8th of April 2016, goes into detail about an attack on a 14-year-old boy that also allegedly occurred in Hampton in 1985. Quote, Another unsolved attack in Hampton, Bill's stamping ground at the time, bore many of the hallmarks of a Mr. Cruel attack, except it was on a 14-year-old boy. Experts say with such offenders it is often more about control and power over victims rather than that of the sex of the victim. The schoolboy was abducted from his Hampton home about 8.25pm on 6 July 1985, five months after the abduction of the 14-year-old Hampton schoolgirl. He was held captive and assaulted in unknown premises for just over three hours before being released in Caulfield South about 11.45 p.m., end quote. The person named Bill here is the pseudonym Keith Moore gave to one of the main suspects in the case, who was later named by Channel 9 as one, quote, Brian Allen Enkler. This, however, was a mistake, as his actual surname is Elkner. Also, Moore was incorrect in stating that Hampton was, quote, Bill's stamping ground at the time. In fact, Elkner had already moved to Thornbury in March of that year, but more on that in a later post. Again, I could find no reference to this attack in the newspaper articles of the day, either in local newspapers or The Age, The Sun News Pictorial or The Herald. Addendum. In a November 2020 interview with Matt Dunlop Media, Retired detective Ron Idles talked briefly about some of these earlier attacks. When questioned about the earlier attacks, he stated, On one of the occasions, it's a vacant house which is up for sale. Now, there was no forced entry, so how did he get access? And then there were questions about, well, could he be a real estate agent? But the way in which he cleaned up, the MO is nearly identical, so that's why they were put in, I guess, a basket to say, well, he might have started back in 85, and you're looking about every six, eight months for an attack. So they were very, very similar. End quote. It is not clear which of these earlier attacks Idles is referring to here. However, the fact that he states that there was no forced entry seems to rule out the attack on the 14 year old boy, as Moore stated that attack occurred at quote, unknown premises. Rather, Idle's description seems to match up with that of the attack on the 14-year-old girl, which was the attack that Moore described as occurring at, quote, a vacant building site. But this cannot be 100% confirmed. A 30-year-old woman from Warrandyte was raped by a man who confronted her in her bedroom. The next non-canonical attack which has been attributed to Mr. Krull, and for which we have a date, was the 4th of December 1985 rape of a 30-year-old woman in Warrandyte. The first article to appear in the press about this attack was the 9th of December 1985 article in The Sun titled New Silver Gun Terror in Rape by Michael Reed. The article reported about a group of three rapes that had all occurred within the space of four days in the eastern suburbs of Warrandyte, Donvale and Bulling. The comment about the new silver gun rapist was a reference to a previous rapist, Peter Vitos, a man who had terrorized the eastern suburbs in the late 1970s and had been sentenced to a long prison term in 1981. He had used a silver handgun in his attacks on women, and it appeared that this new attacker was doing the same thing. On the Warrandyte attack, the article stated, quote, On Wednesday night, a 30-year-old woman from Warrandyte was raped by a man who confronted her in her bedroom. The man wore a balaclava and was possibly armed with a sawn-off shotgun. He was aged 30 to 40, about 180 centimetres tall, broad-shouldered and medium build. The man, armed with a gun, appeared from a walk-in wardrobe while the woman was getting ready for bed. The next day, on the 10th of December 1985, the Doncaster and Templestone News published an article with no author listed titled Police Seek Man After Rape. The article was only about the Warrandyte rape and did not mention the other two that occurred the same week. It included extra details about this attack stating, quote, A spokesman for Doncaster CIB said the man, armed with a gun, appeared from a walk-in wardrobe while the woman was getting ready for bed about 11.10pm on Wednesday. 
Detectives are searching for a man 30 to 40 years old and about 177.5 to 180 centimetres tall in connection with the incident. He is believed to be of medium build with broad shoulders and a pale complexion. Police said he was wearing fawn overalls, a dark balaclava and gloves. A car which police said was used as a getaway vehicle was sighted in the area. Police are carrying out a door knock to try to find more clues. Police said he is well spoken and might drive a white car, possibly a Mercedes Benz. One week later, on the 17th of December 1985, also in the Doncaster and Templestone News, another article was published giving more information about the rapist. The article told of a neighbourhood watch meeting which had taken place in Templestowe Heights. At the meeting, Sergeant David Truman had told the group that, quote, Women who came home to an empty house should be especially careful. He went on to say, quote, He appears to have observed his victim's movements, as in each attack he has known there will not be a man in the house. End quote. The description of the offender stated, quote, The man is believed to be in his late twenties to early thirties, with a muscular chest and clean shaven. A description of his getaway vehicle was also given, quote, Police said he is well spoken and might drive a white car, possibly a Mercedes Benz. As mentioned in the Melbourne Marvels blog post about the Lower Plenty attack, the Warrandai attack was still being linked to the Lower Plenty attack in newspaper articles that appeared in 1987 and 1988. After this, though, it is not mentioned again in the press. Clearly, however, the MO is extremely similar to that of the later crimes. It is unknown whether the Warrandite rape was ever completely ruled out as being the work of Mr. Krull or whether any arrest was ever made. A 30-year-old woman was raped at her Donvale home. The second of the attacks that occurred in December of 1985 was the 6th of December rape of a 30 or 35-year-old woman in Donvale. This attack was still being linked to Mr. Krull by Keith Moore and Jeff Wilkinson as late as 2019. So it is an attack that police who studied it felt had many of the hallmarks of a Mr. Krull attack. It is first mentioned in the aforementioned The Sun article by Michael Reed on the 9th of December 1985. On the Donvale attack, Reed wrote, quote, On Friday night, a 30-year-old woman was raped at her Donvale home. The attacker was in his late 20s or early 30s, slim, clean-shaven with a muscular chest and polite, well-educated voice. He was armed with a rusty silver revolver. As mentioned in the previous podcast about the Lower Plenty attack, the Donvale rape was strongly linked with the Lower Plenty attack. In that podcast, I detailed how Detective Sergeant Val Simpson had told me when I interviewed him that he believed it was the same perpetrator in both attacks. He had said that the rope used in both attacks was identical and was not made in Australia. He had conducted a fruitless search by visiting rope factories in an attempt to identify the source of the rope. He waited in a house for a 30-year-old woman and her 17-year-old sister. The victim in the Donvale rape was described as 35 years old in the 19th of November 1987 Jim Tennyson article for The Sun titled Police Hunt for Mr. Krull. But this was possibly a mistake as, as mentioned in the Lower Plenty blog post, a more detailed description of the Donvale rape appeared in the 12th of May 1988 in S. Willock's article for The Age titled Police Seek a New Mr. Stinky Rapist. Willock's described the attack as thus, quote, Police are certain the first rape was in Donvale on the 6th of December 1985 when he waited in a house for a 30-year-old woman and her 17-year-old sister. When the women arrived at 10.30pm, the older woman was confronted by a man in the lounge at the back of the house. He had broken in through the back door. Armed with a long-barreled pistol, the man took the woman to a bedroom, where he had heard the younger woman talking. Using pantyhose, he tied the girl up and locked her in a bedroom wardrobe, securing the door handles. The man then took the older woman to another bedroom, tied her up and raped her. Police said that during the attack, he called to her sister in the wardrobe to check on her. The rapist spent about 90 minutes in the house after the attack. 
he stole a small amount of money and ripped the telephone from the wall. The Donvale attack was being written about as possibly linked to the other Mr. Krull attacks as recently as 2019, when Keith Moore and Jeff Wilkinson republished Mugshots 1. Moore and Wilkinson mentioned an attack on a 30-year-old woman in 1985 in this book. Although no suburb is mentioned, this is probably a reference to the Donvale attack. As mentioned previously, I believe the same attack was that that was referred to in John Sylvester and Andrew Rule's book, Rats. Therefore, we know it is still considered to be likely the work of Mr. Krull. A bullying woman, 34, was asleep with her six-year-old daughter when she was awoken by a man about 11.30pm. The last attack that occurred in the spate of rapes in December 1985 was the one on a 34-year-old woman in Bulleen on the 7th of December 1985. In his article, Michael Reed described it thus, quote, On Saturday, a Bulleen woman, 34, was asleep with her six-year-old daughter when she was awoken by a man about 11.30 p.m. Police said he was armed with a silver pistol or sawn-off shotgun. The man was described as in his late twenties or early thirties, slim with mousy hair and wearing faded jeans and a t-shirt. I have not found any other sources that describe this attack. It was still being considered as possibly linked to the Lower Plenty attack when the latter occurred in August 1987 meaning it went unsolved until at least this date. Like the Warrandyte attack, it disappears from being mentioned in the same breath as other Mr. Krull attacks after 1987, but I do not know if it was ever solved. The woman told them she fought with the man as he tried to pull off both his and her clothes. Next we come to the Greensboro attacks that occurred in March and on the 8th of August 1987. These offences were first written about by Sally MacDonnell for the Diamond Valley News on the 25th of August 1987 in an article titled Would-be Rapist May Strike Again, Police. The 8th of August attack was described thus, quote, Police said the masked man forced his way into the Joyce Avenue home at 5am on Saturday, August 8th. The woman was asleep alone in the house. Police said the woman told them she fought with the man as he tried to pull off both his and her clothes. She told police the man repeatedly assaulted her during the 15-minute ordeal. The woman said the man forced her to commit an indecent act on him. Wore a stocking mask and was of muscular build. The same article described the first Greensboro attack in March thus, quote, Detective Senior Constable Wayne Amore of Greensboro CIB said a similar incident occurred at Poulter Avenue, also in Greensboro, last March at 1am, when a man forced his way into the house occupied by a woman and two young children. Amore was then quoted as stating, There are certain factors which are similar and certain factors which aren't so. Whether it's the same person at this stage, we don't know. The article went on to state, Quote, Detective Senior Constable Amor said the two houses were one street away from each other. He said on both occasions the man who forced his way into the house wore a stocking mask and was of muscular build. Amor was quoted as saying, What disturbs us is that it appears that in both instances the offender had prior knowledge of the house and its occupants and may well have been watching the house prior to the offence. The offender is described as being 175 to 177 centimetres, or 5 foot 9 to 5 foot 10, and of muscular build. As mentioned in an earlier podcast, the Greensboro attacks were mentioned as being possibly linked to the Lower Plenty attack in the Sally McDonnell article about the latter crime when it was reported on in the Diamond Valley News on the 1st of September 1987, describing those attacks thus, quote, Detective Sergeant Simpson said police were keeping an open mind as to whether he was the same person responsible for two recent attempted rapes in the Joyce Avenue, Greensboro area. On both of those occasions, a man forced entry into houses at about 4am early on Saturday mornings and attempted to rape the female occupant of each house. However, afterwards, the Greensboro attacks are not mentioned again in the press in the same breath as the other Mr. Cruel attacks. What cannot be denied, however, is the striking similarity of the description of this offender 
and the man who committed the December 1985 attacks. It is unknown if the Greensboro attacks were ever completely ruled out of the Mr. Krull case or whether any arrests were ever made. Threatened her with a knife, bound and gagged her, and then raped her. I covered the Mooney Ponds attack quite extensive in the podcast about the Lower Plenty attack because they were strongly linked at the time and occurred within three months of one another. It was first reported about under the title Police Hunt for Mr. Cruel by Jim Tennyson in The Sun on the 19th of November 1987. Tennyson said that the offender in this attack broke into the home of a 48-year-old woman and, quote, threatened her with a knife, bound and gagged her, and then raped her. The man then stole her bank card and went to a bank in Mooney Ponds, where he withdrew $300 from her bank account. He had then returned to the woman's house and, quote, sexually assaulted her again before leaving in the early hours of last Wednesday morning. Park Street or Clarinda Road On the 25th of November 1987, an article by Nadine Hartnett said that the attack occurred at, quote, 10 p.m., before describing the attack in the same way as was in Jim Tennyson's article. However, more information was given on the location and the description of the attacker. He was described as, quote, a slim man wearing pale blue jeans, and, quote, could have been seen near Park Street or Clarinda Road between 9.30 and 10 p.m. on November 10th, or at the Commonwealth Bank in Puckle Street near Pratt Street between 1 and 1.30 a.m. the next morning. He admonished the woman and raped her again. The next article to cover the Mooney Ponds attack in detail was by Ines Willicks for The Age in an article titled Police Seek a New Mr. Stinky Rapist on the 12th of May 1988. He stated that the attack occurred on, quote, the 10th of November 1987. The man broke into the house at 9.20 p.m. Notice this is different from the time of 10 p.m. given in Nadine Hartnett's article in the Essendon Gazette. And used a knife to threaten the 48-year-old woman who lived alone. She was sleeping when she was attacked. The rapist did not turn on the lights. He tied her up with nylon cord, which is not available in Australia, and then raped her. He emptied her handbag and took her automatic teller machine card. Police are certain he planned the attack because he walked almost a kilometre to a bank with an automatic withdrawal machine. He withdrew $300 from the woman's account and walked back to the house. He was away about 45 minutes. During that time, the woman freed herself of her gag and called for help. When the man returned, he admonished the woman and raped her again, before ripping out the telephone and leaving. The woman's ordeal lasted more than four hours. Mr. Cool? In a long article for The Age titled Brutal Abductor Breeds Fear with Cruelty, published three weeks after Carmen Chan's abduction, Anthony Catalano claimed that a police task force set up after the Mooney Ponds attack dismissed it as not the work of Mr. Cruel. This is strange indeed, as as recently as 2019, Xanthi Mallet, in the chapter of her book, Cold Case Investigations, that dealt with Mr. Cruel, was asserting that the Mooney Ponds attack was the work of Mr. Cruel. Catalana also offered a speculative origin story for the term Mr. Cruel, claiming that it was coined when police initially thought the identity of the attacker of the 48-year-old former nun and the Lower Plenty victim were one and the same. They had, he claimed, called the perpetrator in the Lower Plenty case, quote, Mr. Cool. So when Chief Police Commissioner for Crime, Mr. Vaughan Werner, described the perpetrator in the Mooney Ponds case as Cruel, the name Mr. Cruel appeared as the headline the next day in the Sun article by Jim Tennyson about the rape. However, I can find no source that backs up this story as being fact. While the perpetrator in the Lower Plenty attack case had been described as, quote, cool and calculating, nowhere have I found evidence that he was referred to as Mr. Cool. Furthermore, the fact that Catalano refers to the linking of the Mooney Ponds rape with the Lower Plenty rape as a, quote, mix-up, when some experts have more recently asserted that the two crimes were linked, makes this information even more confusing. As mentioned previously, John Sylvester and Andrew Rule also argued this origin story for the name Mr. Cruel in their 2008 book. However, I suspect they have simply repeated Catalano's speculation 
as they have not found one source which backs the claim that he was originally referred to as Mr. Cool in the published record. No, Mr. Cruel wasn't an exclusive paedophile. The most recent publication to link the Mooney Ponds attack with Mr. Cruel was Xanthi Mallet in her 2019 book Cold Case Investigations. Mallet then went on to describe her belief that the offender, quote, specifically targeted children in their prepubescent stage before they go through puberty and develop secondary sexual characteristics. I was interested to know whether Mr. Cruel was a paedophile in the true sense of the word. She then goes on to state that she knew criminal psychologist Tim Watson Munro had worked on the Mr. Cruel case, and so she asked him his opinion on whether Mr. Cruel was a paedophile. Quote, No, Mr. Cruel wasn't an exclusive paedophile, he replied. Mallet then goes on to explain, in Watson Munro's words, how he had been retained by Victoria Police to profile Mr. Cruel's offending which exposed him to the, quote, full range of his actions. These included the rape and confinement of an elderly nun in a Melbourne northern suburb, with him brazenly taking her car and her ATM card in order to drive to a local bank and steal her savings, end quote. This is clearly referring to the Mooney Ponds attack on the night of the 10th to 11th of November, 1987. Except Tim Watson Monroe has referred to the woman as elderly, when the woman in question was reported at the time as being only 48 years old. And there is another inconsistency. According to Mallet, Watson Munro told her that the offender stole the woman's car and drove it to the bank. However, in S. Willicks's article from the 12th of May 1988, clearly stated that the offender walked to the bank before stealing the woman's savings. Mallet also said that Watson Munro told her the woman was a nun, Anthony Catalano's 4th of May 1991 article which mentioned the Mooney Ponds attack stated that the woman in question was a former nun. Catalano also claimed that police had ruled out the attack as being the work of Mr. Cruel. One can only speculate that Mr. Watson Munro may have remembered this case incorrectly. It is possible, of course, that the police publicly stated that the woman was only 48 years old so as to protect her true identity from being revealed publicly, as the police were known to do this in the 1980s. Whether the woman was a nun or a former nun, however, I do not feel like I can speculate on. Four Mysterious Attacks Lastly, we come to the four mysterious attacks on girls and women that, according to John Sylvester and Andrew Rule's 2008 book Rats, occurred between 1985 and 1987 in the suburbs of Hawthorne, Caulfield, Brighton, and Dingley. Unfortunately, I can find absolutely no reports of these attacks in any of the contemporary newspaper sources. All we know is that some police believe that they were possibly the work of Mr. Cruel. Perhaps more will be revealed about these attacks at some point in the future. If you have gained something from this podcast, please consider donating to my Patreon to cover the costs I have incurred in researching it. And I would like to thank Taylor Lyons for becoming a subscriber to Melbourne Marvels. Thank you very much, Taylor. You can find my account on Patreon by searching for Melbourne, as in the city, Marvels. Please view the Melbourne Marvels website for a record of all the sources I relied on in producing this episode. You can find that at Melbourne, M-E-L-B-I-N, Marvels.com. There you will also find links to all my socials on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you prefer to use YouTube, you can listen to all these podcasts there at my channel, Melbourne, spelt like the city, Marvels. And don't forget to subscribe to Melbourne Marvels on your favorite podcasting app. Please remember that the Mr. Cruel case is a cold case investigation, meaning that these crimes all remain unsolved. If you have any information that you believe can help to solve any of these crimes I've mentioned in this podcast, please contact Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. If you would like to contact me to discuss this case, you can send me an email on melbin, M-E-L-B-I-N, marvels at gmail.com. Or you can message the Melbourne Marvels page on Facebook. Thank you very much for listening.